We have now released issue three of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Download it for free at newthinkingaloud.org. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm another version of Jeffrey Mishlove, much in the way that Jeffrey Mishlove, you could say, is another version of yourself. Of course, I think I'm a little more intimately connected to him than you are. In fact, I think I'd have to say he's probably a lot more connected to me. You could even say we share the same thoughts moment by moment. But I like to use my friend over there as a conversation partner. Today, I am going to address an issue that is complicated and a little bit thorny, and it has a history. It's going to be about addressing the problem of animosity and violence in our culture, particularly the American culture. But actually, I think animosity seems to be growing around the world. And no doubt, there are many reasons for it. It could be related to climate change. It could be related to population density. It doesn't matter. It's happening for a variety of reasons. But we are human beings. And one of the basic foundational truths and that the New Thinking Loud program expresses that as human beings, we are endowed with certain properties of consciousness that are studied by parapsychologists, traditionally known as extrasensory perception and psychokinesis, or in yoga, the siddhis, or in Christian tradition, the gifts of the spirit. We are all spiritual beings endowed with the innate powers of consciousness, powers of intention that are gifted to us simply by virtue of being born, by being aware, by being sentient. Well, what does this have to do with the issue of gun violence? It's going to take me a little while to unravel the story, so please bear with me. I want you to know about, if you haven't already seen, and even if you have, you may wish to review two monologues that I gave, the first one on December 28th and the second one about three months later about a unusual experience I had regarding the PK man, Ted Owens. And I'm going to link right now for those of you who are able to click on these links. If you haven't seen these two monologues, or even if you have, they're well worth watching again. But I'll also summarize them. It was last December 2022 when I got an email from a, a viewer in Germany named Javier Flores who told me that he, being a meditator, was in deep meditation, meditated for about half an hour when a figure appeared to him in his meditation. And gradually, he recognized the figure as a human being. And because Javier is a regular viewer of New Thinking Aloud, he's heard, you know, I've probably done half a dozen or more programs about the research I conducted with Mr. Ted Owens, who called himself the PK Man. And I did this research between 1976 and his death in 1987. So by the time Javier had his vision in meditation, Ted Owens had been dead for some 35 
years. And Javier began to tune into this image. It was an angry image. And if you know the story of the PK man, you'll understand he was often an angry person. He tried over and over and over again to demonstrate his unusual psychokinetic abilities, his control over large-scale events, the weather, hurricanes, tornadoes, heat spells, cold spells, droughts, volcanoes, earthquakes, power blackouts, and, and the like. I have in my files over 160 examples of these demonstrations. And sadly, he was mostly ignored and scorned by people, except for uh, a few, a handful of scientists. And I, a, a young graduate student, when I first met him, took him seriously and tried to document what he was doing. Javier said if th that the message from Ted Owens, for me, was that I should try to reach out to him in meditation and contact him. And on December 28th, that's precisely what happened. I was in a meditative state, something of a hypnagogic state, half awake, half asleep, when I really did have a very strong feeling I was communicating with him. It was vivid. It was distinct. And I said to him, and this is on December 28th, 2022, the day I made the first monologue, that uh, at the time I was aware of the situation in Ukraine and how winter was setting in and the Russians who were invading Ukraine were knocking out all the power facilities so the people of Ukraine might be forced to face a very cold winter without adequate power. And I remembered that on one of his demonstrations, Ted Owens had been known to create warm weather in the winter. And so I said to him, could you do that here in Ukraine so that these people don't have to suffer through an impossibly cold winter? And Ted Owens responded. He said to me, I will ask the space intelligences, the supposed alien or other dimensional beings that he works with, that he claims were the source of his power. He described them alternately in many different ways. Sometimes they were aspects of the divine. Sometimes he pictured them as like uh, giant grasshoppers or uh, praying mantis-like beings. Sometimes he said they were energy beings. Sometimes he thought of them as part of nature or God. He said he would contact them and see what could be done. And in my video on the 28th of December, I said, we're going to run a test for 90 days. We'll see what happens to the weather in Ukraine. In the subsequent video, I laid out, I think it was almost uh, to the 28th of March, near the conclusion of that 90-day period. And I summarized the data as I saw it at that time, which was it did get warmer in Ukraine. The people didn't suffer through a terrible winter. In fact, at one point, I think they were even exporting electricity or had the capability of, of doing this. However, it was not statistically significant. And I uh, worked with an atmospheric scientist, Danny Caputi, to, to run an analysis. I can show you the statistics. So, you can see uh, from this graph that uh, the weather was warmer, distinctly warmer, but not so much so when we ran the statistical tests to say it was uh, beyond chance. And Danny Caputi pointed out to me, it's a good thing it wasn't beyond chance because we're already dealing with a situation of global warming. And had it gotten any warmer than it did get, that might have severe consequences for the global weather situation. But it had a real impact on the war itself in Ukraine. Let me explain. You see, three days after I made that announcement on December 28th, on January 21st of this year, 2023, a thousand temperature records were broken all across Europe. 
Not only that, but the uh, meteorologists and atmospheric scientists who study extreme weather events were amazed. They weren't expecting it. And not only that, it, it, it seemed unpredictable. One uh, person announced on their website, this is insane what was going on. So it wasn't just Ukraine. It was all of Europe that experienced uh, an extremely warm winter. Not only that, but the Russians, according to news reports, had been hoping that the Western democracies and their opposition to the Russian invasion of Ukraine would fold. They would collapse because they were dependent upon Russian natural gas and oil. And that didn't happen because it was such a warm winter across Europe. Not statistically significantly warm, but warm enough to make a real difference in the war. So, that was the ultimate conclusion of that little 90-day exercise, and it left me puzzled. I had to say to myself, was Ted Owens involved? That event on January 1st certainly did seem like the sort of thing I had come to expect during my years of working with them, really dramatic findings. And yet, on the other hand, it wasn't statistically significant overall. And then I thought to myself, well, was I really in contact with Ted Owens, the man who had died 35 years earlier? Was he trying to perform a psychokinetic large-scale event from the other side or not? As I was contemplating all of this, I was visited by Robert Bigelow, and, and he suggested some alternatives. He said to me, maybe Ted Owens was just coming to say goodbye as he moves on to a higher dimension of the afterlife. Or maybe he wants to atone for many of the negative events. And if you were to read my book, The PK Man, you'd know there were negative events. Unfortunately, he was confronted by people who, who treated him poorly when he came to various cities and would announce, I am the great PK man. I have come to end the drought. I have come to do this and that for your community. And people would say, you're an idiot. You're a fool. Get out of here. And he would think to himself or say and say to other people such as myself and other scientists who were w monitoring what he was doing, he would say, I think I need to teach these people a lesson. And the lessons were often unpleasant. So, Robert suggested to me maybe he really wants to atone for that kind of behavior when he was alive. Maybe he wants to engage in further projects with you. And I thought to myself, well, what would be an ideal project? It would have to be something that was socially meaningful, that made a real difference to people, not just, you know, a dice throwing or card guessing experiment of the type that parapsychologists used to do. And it needed to be something that could be measured scientifically, statistically. What could that be? And I actually, last summer, gave a presentation at the uh, annual convention. I was the banquet speaker uh, for an organization, a wonderful organization known as the Society for Scientific Exploration. The SSE is a group of people scientists, all of them, who are looking at unconventional approaches to science, anomalies. It could be UFOs, it could be tapping into zero-point energy, uh, such as the recent interview with Garrett Modell. It could be parapsychology or uh, cryptozoology, uh, cattle mutilations, all sorts of strange areas of science and uh, things that are uh, controversial. They explore and they've been publishing a journal for many years. So, I gave this presentation at that conference about the experience with Ted Owens, and I asked the scientists in attendance if they thought of a project that would be meaningful that we could see if uh, Ted Owens was willing to do something that would be socially meaningful and statistically, scientifically measurable. Actually, nobody offered any 
clear ideas at that point. Subsequently, however, in meditation, I had an insight of my own. What about gun violence? I, frankly, sick and tired of turning on my television, <laughs> watching the news and hearing about another mass shooting or hearing about all of the thousands of people who are maimed and murdered or who commit suicide by virtue of gun violence in the United States every year. I think the statistic is now that gun violence is the leading cause of death in children. And to me, that's unnecessary and unacceptable. I began wondering, is this something Ted Owens could address? And I might as well say right now that I have not had any further experiences in meditation where I felt uh, in such a strong way as I did last December 28th that I was in communication with Ted Owens. So, for all I know, he's moved on. I'm not sure. I have heard from a few other people who have mediumistic abilities who believe that they may be in touch with him. So, as I say, I'm not sure. But the issue with gun violence, as I understand it, has been that every time an event occurs, the Democrats, and I'm a lifelong Democrat uh, and intend to remain one, frankly, the Democrats say, we've got to do something about all these guns. And the Republicans say, this isn't the time for it. This is the time for thoughts and prayers. And the Democrats say, thoughts and prayers aren't going to help. But from my perspective, thoughts and prayers can help. The thing is, why wait till after the fact? Shouldn't thoughts and prayers be what we do beforehand? Now, this is not an idea that is unique to me. Many people probably are aware of the program called the Maharishi Effect that was initiated back, I think, in the 1970s by the Transcendental Meditation Organization, where they'd bring groups of meditators, sometimes advanced meditators, into particular cities. They just meditate. They do their mantras. And then they would watch various social statistics, in particular crime statistics, poverty statistics, and they would show that when, I think according to them, when more than 1% of the population is engaged in transcendental meditation in a particular city, it affects the whole community. And they went on to say that with regard to their advanced meditators who had gone through what they called the TM City program, it only took the square root of 1% of the population to produce an effect. Well, I know that they've published dozens of articles in uh, many different contexts, in, in some in mainstream journals about the Maharishi effect. And as you might expect, it's more or less been ignored by the mainstream sociological or scientific community for the simple reason that they can't come up with, from a materialistic perspective, any theory that would account for such an effect. So, they say, you know, there must be something wrong. And besides which, when you have an organization like Transcendental Meditation doing research on itself, it's inherently untrustworthy. It would be like the tobacco companies doing research on the harmful effects of smoking, etc. You want, ideally, such research to be done by an independent organization. Nevertheless, the research is out there. And I can say the parapsychology community has taken note of that research for a good reason. And that is that we have a wide range of other independent experiments that suggest that there is a mechanism. Uh, mechanism isn't the right word because it's not mechanistic at all. But uh, there are comparable findings in what we call, for example, distant healing, healing at a distance. And I've reported on that 
One of the most clear-cut examples would be the report by Elizabeth Rauscher and uh, the interview, which is on the New Thinking Aloud channel, in which she worked with a, a very talented healer, Olga Worrell, who uh, was able to produce measurable effects over a distance of thousands of miles and, and healing effects that could be measured in bacteria, uh, etc. And there's, uh, at this point in time, I would say there are probably many, many dozen well controlled scientific exper experiments on distant healing. Now, I don't think that you'll ever explain it in mechanistic terms. You can try. People do try, but there are no agreed upon interpretations. And I think the reason is because we're dealing with the nature of consciousness itself. And if one accepts the metaphysical principle that consciousness is primary, it cannot be reduced to a mechanism. Consciousness is basic. The universe that we experience is ultimately grounded in consciousness itself. Not my personal consciousness, not your personal consciousness, but the consciousness that we share. You could say mind at large, the global consciousness, the spirit in which we're all embedded. So, while we have ways of looking at it empirically, that's what parapsychology is, it's an empirical science, it's not a mechanistic science, it's not grounded in materialistic metaphysics. Maybe someday it would be. I don't want to rule that out completely because we do live in uh, such a strongly materialistic culture. I think there will be ways that materialism can be contorted or modified to accommodate these things. But I do, as I think most viewers know, lean towards an idealistic interpretation or a spiritual interpretation of these things, meaning that spirit or consciousness is primary. Now, the point is that you, as a viewer, can meditate, can concentrate, can visualize a situation in which people who are agitated, people who are on the verge of committing violence, might receive a message, a thought form to relax, to breathe deeply, to think twice before going out and committing an atrocity of one kind or another. And let me speak personally about this. I can only speak from my own experience, and, and it is very personal because I don't have data that when I meditate on ending violence or ending abrasiveness in our culture that I, I'm able to measure any kind of a result. Of course, I'm not. How am I to do that, especially while I'm meditating? But I can say this. It makes sense to me. There are moments when I meditate on such a thing where I get the impression I'm spinning my wheels. I'm trying to crank out a thought, but it's just a thought in my head. And then there are other moments when I seem to enter into a, a different kind of a state. I don't have a label for it, but maybe it's even a state akin to samadhi or something where I have a deep knowing. And the deep knowing is this is healing. This is healing the world. And maybe it's even reaching out to a particular human being and affecting them. It's like an inner certainty that uh, it's not just me from my ego level cranking out a thought anymore. It's a resonance and, and something is happening. But my plan is here on the New Thinking Aloud channel, working with my co-host, Emmy Vadness, who I think is gifted at developing forms of guided meditations and visualizations and, and the like, to develop a series of such meditations that viewers can try for themselves. And uh, one such meditation that was suggested to me it was called the Tang Long meditation, comes from the Tibetan tradition. 
is one in which you take into yourself the anger, the hostility, the negative vibration that somebody is feeling, and you heal it within yourself and then release it, send it back out into the world. I'm sure there are many other styles of meditation that might be aimed at that same ultimate goal. And one of the things that parapsychologists seem to understand is that when engaging in such a practice, you could call it psychokinesis or telepathic transmission, if you like, it's not so much the method that counts as the goal, the focus, the intention to achieve a particular goal, not the step-by-step -step process of getting there. In any case, we will be releasing meditations of that sort on this channel. And I know we're growing our audience. We now have 149,000 subscribers as of today and, and growing. But we are also part of a network. The hundreds of people who have been interviewed on New Thinking Aloud represent hundreds of other organizations. And I know there are other organizations out in the world Probably many of you watching this monologue, if you've gotten that far, are aware of them that have a goal similar to ours, a goal of a world based on, well, what do they say? Peace on earth, goodwill, etc. A world in which all people are happy, the Buddhist metta meditation, all sentient beings are happy. The goal of people living and working in harmony, or at least not at each other's throats. After all, I, I'm not against tension. I'm not against creative tension in particular. I'm not against disagreement. I don't think we all need to be on the same page on every issue. But I think it would be very nice if people of goodwill, from many different perspectives, scientific, religious, meditative, mystical, who wish to concentrate on this goal, and I hope it'll be possible. I have no objection if Ted Owens and the space intelligences are available to help out as well. If, if as I think might be the case, there was some influence last winter on Ukraine, that maybe it can help end a war. Maybe it can help end a shooting somewhere. Maybe it won't be even detectable in a statistically measurable way, or maybe it will be, but maybe one or two lives will be saved. I have no idea. But I am issuing a call right now for people who are interested to join in. This is thoughts and prayers in advance, not after the fact. And if you are a member of a group of people who are interested in doing something with your divine consciousness, because I think we are all sparks of the divine and, and want to exercise it in a positive way, join with me. And certainly I'm not trying to take any credit for this. I know that there are people who have been actively sending out healing prayers and energy for decades. But this is a, a contribution that I think the New Thinking Aloud channel wishes to join in on. So thank you very much for listening to me. And remember, you are the reason that we are here. God bless. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.